So, once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you please would take a seat so we can start with the first panel today. My name is uh, Christoph Heubner from Berlin and I'm representing the International Auschwitz Committee. That was one of the committees founded by Auschwitz survivors in 1952 and later opening for foundations and younger people supporting the survivors. That's why I'm, as a German citizen, sitting here. And I know that for a German citizen, it is a special responsibility to be the moderator of this first panel. Thank you very, very much to the Czech government and to the Esli Institute for having this conference. It was very moving to see Felix Kolmer and the other survivors from the Czech Republic supporting Mr. Schittler and Mr. Czestetsky by preparing this conference together with the Esli Institute. It is very important that the survivors are taking part. Special greetings to all of you from Mr. Roman Kent, an Auschwitz survivor and the president of the International Auschwitz Committee from New York, who works very close with Stuart Eisenstadt. A very special welcome to the panelists this morning, Mrs. Rowana Plump, the Minister of Labor, Family, Social Protections and Elderly of Romania to Mr. Michael Farugia, the Minister for the Family and Social Solidarity of Malta, to Mr. Marek Buccio, the Under Secretary of State of the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy of Poland, and to Mr. Gary Koren, the Ambassador of Israel to the Czech Republic. Before inviting Minister Plump to give the first lecture, Allow me two small remarks. What dignity are we talking about today during this meeting? We talk about the dignity of the survivors, but more, we talk about the dignity of all of us. We have to honor and support the survivors in their needs, and we have to thank all of them in all European societies and all over the world by encouraging young people for democracy and tolerance. Many of the survivors have given witness to groups in schools, to young people, to many, many members of society by telling what happened, why it happened, and what does it mean today. What they have done for the development of tolerance against anti-Semitism, right-wing extremism in European societies, can't be underestimated. It's very important to honor them for their educational support of our life today. With these few words, I would like Mrs. Rovana Plump, the Minister of Labor and Family and Social Protections and Elderly of Romania, to give her lecture. Very welcome. Thank you very much, Chair. Good day to everybody. Um, allow me first to extend uh, my warm thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to attend this event where we can discuss the latest developments uh, in the field of welfare uh, for Holocaust uh, survivors and other victims of uh, Nazi persecution. Uh, I would also like to express my respect to all those uh, Holocaust survivors and to extend my regards to my fellow colleagues 
from uh, EU and non-EU member states to the ambassadors and also to the representatives of the NGOs. I am uh, very pleased to see you today and to discuss a topic that interests our societies and our governments. When I received the invitation uh, from my friend uh, Mikaela Marksova, Minister of Labor and Social Affairs of the Czech Republic, I accepted to be one of the panelists, being aware that the discussion today will be open and will put forward the needs and the challenges ahead. As a government representative, I look forward to uh, for new ideas, how we can improve our record in this field. In my opinion, as citizen of a country that has experienced democracy in the last 25 years, the level of the state responsibility towards the Holocaust victims reflects the Holocaust awareness of the society. In this context, it was acknowledged that responsibility in developing welfare methods for Holocaust survivors is borne by the Romanian government. This is one of the reasons uh, why Romania became a signatory of the 2009 Terezin Declaration. The ultimate goal of this process is contributing to the dignity of the Holocaust survivors and other victims of the Nazi perse uh, persecution. In the aftermath of the collapse of the communist regime, the Romanian authorities drafted a couple of laws targeting the compensation of those Romanian citizens that were victims of the dictatorial regimes. It was a non-discriminatory policy and the Romanian Jews were one of the those entitled for such compensations in terms of welfare and property restitutions. When in 2004 the report of the Eli Wiesel International Commission was published, Romania officially acknowledged its participation in the Holocaust. It was a commitment of the entire society and of the Romanian government of that moment, and it has never ceased to be so until these days. Ladies and gentlemen, the Romanian authorities adopted a couple of laws targeting the compensation of those Romanian citizens that starting on uh, the 6th of September 1940 were victims of the dictatorial regimes as well as persons that were deported or became prisoners. The other side of the coin was the process of restitution of properties that belonged to the Romanian Jews and were illegally confiscated. In 2014, was adopted a law regarding the granting of rights to the persons persecuted by the regimes installed in, uh, installed in Romania beginning with September 6, 1940 until March 6, 1945 on ethnic grounds. The new law will come into force as uh, of July 1st this year and it regulates the increase of the amount of the recognition uh, indemnities. According to our statistics, until April 2015, the number of the beneficiaries was of approximately 150,000 uh, people, Jews and non-Jewish people. Likewise, on the property restitution level, in 2013, Romania adopted a legislation that mainly regulates the restitution in kind and where this is no longer possible, the award of an equitable compensation. 
fully aware of the importance of a proper resolution of the restitution issue, Romania is among the first states in southeastern Europe to render null and void the discriminatory legislative measures regarding Jews. The restitution of gods confiscated during the communist regime belonging to the religious and minority communities was regulated after the fall of the communist regime by a special legislation regarding restitution to the religious and minority groups. It is to be noted that the mechanism of the restitution of properties compensation it's applicable for all religious and minority communities. The principal governing these legislative measures is the restitution in kind where possible. For all other situations, compensatory measures are currently regulated by the general rules on compensatory measures adopted in 2013. The restitution process is ongoing the applicants having the possibility to complete their files with the missing documents. Dear colleagues, the efforts of the Romanian government, including of the ministry that I am heading, will not cease to develop in the field of social responsibility towards its past. The Holocaust survivors are Romanian citizens and will strive to facilitate a better and dignified life to the best of our proficiency. I am glad to see here the representatives of the Israeli government and Holocaust survivors with whom we have an open dialogue and we try to identify solutions for the Holocaust survivors. I hope that the illustration of the example of Romania in the field of social welfare, as well as other examples of other EU and non-EU states, will lay the basis for a thorough and live debate. Holocaust does not belong to a single nation. It belongs to the whole mankind. In the memory of the millions of children and persons who perished, it is our duty to assure that this huge human tragedy will never be repeated again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Plump. Holocaust doesn't belong to a nation, it belongs to mankind. We are very happy that Mr. Michael Farrugia, the Minister for the Family and Social Solidarity of Malta, is being our next speaker. You are welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. And it is indeed my honor to address this plenary session. When Minister Mikaela Marksova invited me to address this conference, um, I accepted with open arms, especially um, thinking about what happened 70, uh, 75 years ago, where Malta played a very active role in the Mediterranean. A role that actually led to a scenario where North Africa was changing hands from one side to the other. In the wake of the 2017th anniversary of the liberation from Auschwitz and the end of the Second World War, there is a pressing need to keep the memory of such horrors alive, especially at a time where the sentiments that brought about such a tragedy are once again resurfacing in many countries. It is no coincidence that the crimes committed during the Holocaust brought about much devastation against Europe, especially in Eastern, in Eastern Europe. Hence, 
this international conference serves as a stark reminder of the lasting impact on the victims of this tragedy and also highlights the importance of our moral obligation in assisting such victims so that they can live in tranquility and dignity. Malta has no known Holocaust survivors and therefore does not have any welfare programs which specifically address the need of such persons. However, Malta has an extensive and well-established social safety net designed to curb social inequality and exclusion by enabling people not only to meet their basic needs, but also to enjoy a decent life through the provision, among other things, of an adequate income. The Maltese government believes that social protection is an integ integral part of the functioning of high performance and employment social market economies, whilst, while also coming to the aid of those who are more vulnerable or needy in society. Thus, our vision is to look towards ensuring that the social welfare provisions in the country run parallel to the objective of creating opportunities while discouraging dependencies and at the same time guaranteeing social, sustainable social protection. As a result, combating poverty and social exclusion is a priority for the Maltese government. In this regard, for the past two years, the Maltese government has worked hard to improve the standard of living for all especially those cohorts of the population who are more at risk of poverty and social exclusion. Various budget measures and other initiatives have been taken, such as the reduction of water and electricity tariffs, the provision of free childcare so as to enable more women to remain in or to re-enter the labor market, and the launching of a supplementary benefit for children, the payment of which is also subject to regular school attendance. Furthermore, we have introduced more benefits for persons with disability, and our intention is to introduce benefit improvements for pensioners in the coming months by way of pensions reform measures. Malta acknowledges the important role that the European Shoah Legacy Institute in Terezin has in the fight against racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism in Europe and the rest of the world. The support and cooperation of countries and international institutions is pivotal to the Institute's continued, continued success. As one of the signatory countries to the Terezin Declaration in June 2009, Malta will continue to collaborate and support the Institute's work towards ensuring assistance, redress, and remembrance for victims of Nazi persecution. In this regard, I must highlight the fact that Maltese legislation has been strengthened to discourage and penalize actions that instigate racism and xenophobic ideals and sentiments. In fact, the Criminal Code in Malta, Article 82A, stipulates that whoever uses any threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior, or displays any written or printed material which is threatening, threatening abusive, or insulting, or otherwise conducts himself in such a manner with intent thereby to stir up violence or social hatred, or whereby violence or social hatred is likely, having regard to all the circumstances, to be stirred up shell on conviction, be liable to imprisonment for a term of six to 18 months. 
Besides, the criminal code, Article 82B, also stipulates that whoever publicly condones, denies, or gross grossly trivializes genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes directed against a group of persons or a member of such a group incites to violence or hatred against such a group or a member of it or disturbs public order or which is threatening, abusive or insulting shall on conviction be liable to imprisonment for a term from 18 months to two years. Moreover, the Maltese Parliament commemorates annually the Holocaust Remembrance Day on the 27th of January with a special parliamentary session. And this year, a discussion was held to highlight the need to combat situations of xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism, which unfortunately continue to exist in today's societies. The worldwide remembrance of this tra tragedy is an obligation we all have towards those who succumbed to or continue to suffer from the atrocities of Holocaust so that their loss of life and suffering is neither forgotten nor lost to future generations. It is also a sentiment present and future generations should aspire to uphold. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Minister Farouja, for your encouragement due to the pressing needs of the survivors and the interesting information you gave us. And uh, we are happy to give the floor now to Mr. Marek Buccio, the Under Secretary of State of the Ministry of Labour and Social Policy of the Republic of Poland. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is uh, Marek Bucior. Uh, I have the honor to represent uh, the Polish uh, Ministry of uh, Labor and uh, Social Policy. In the beginning, I would like uh, to pay your attention that the responsibility of the Polish state results from a difficult uh, Polish uh, history. Uh, we need to remember that before the Second World War, the Polish uh, society used to be multicultural and uh, multinational. About uh, one third of the population were uh, national minorities. It is important to mention that the Jewish minority amounted to 10% of the society, of the Polish or Polish society. It uh, means that uh, in, in 1939, about 3.5 million Jews of Jews uh, inhabited uh, Poland. During the Second World War, Nazi German authorities were consistently conducting the extermination policy on the occupied Polish uh, territory. As uh, the result uh, of this inhuman, barbarous uh, policy, about six million Polish citizens lost uh, their lives. Among them were about uh, three million Polish uh, Jews uh, who died in ghettos, gas chambers, in concentration camps. Uh, we should emphasize that although during the war the Polish soil was occupied, a lot of uh, Polish citizens were fighting against uh, the aggressors in uh, Polish uh, armies in Western and Eastern Europe, but also as uh, partisans. Appreciating the efforts and uh, sacrifice uh, of combatants and the victims of uh, Nazi uh, persecution, the Polish state uh, treats them with uh, special care and uh, recognition. After the democratic transition in, in 1989, uh, numerous combatants organizations uh, began, uh, began to spring up. Uh, among them were the Association of uh, Jewish Combatants and Victims of World War II and the 
children of the Holocaust Association. In uh, 1991, Free Poland uh, voted a special, a special status uh, for all those citizens who were uh, repressed and uh, fought for independence. It uh, was the expression of our recognition and uh, gratitude. In this way, the Polish state tried to reward and compensate the victims of persecution. Uh, it should be stressed that people incarcerated in ghettos are one of the groups of the current bef beneficiaries of uh, Polish uh, combatant law. Uh, Polish citizens of uh, Jewish nationality or origin, but uh, not only the Jewish uh, nationality or uh, origin, but uh, also the uh, second two, uh, for example, uh, Roma nationality or origin, Holocaust survivors and other victims of uh, Nazi persecution have been enjoying various forms of uh, Polish public aid. People in uh, possession of uh, combatant rights, uh, which uh, comprise victims of the Holocaust, are entitled to a monthly flat rate of about 100 euros. Their widows or widowers uh, receive an allowance of about 50 uh, euros and both a 51% uh, reduction of uh, domestic transport fares. Victims of oppression are also granted priority uh, in the access to community welfare services and uh, homes for the elderly. Person, a person in difficult uh, financial situation uh, may receive uh, short-term financial assistance. Another important form of support for those who lost health and got injured in the course of repressions are invalidity pensions of about 500 euros. The widows or widowers receive about 450 euros. From the 18th of April 2015, also this year, all veterans and victims of oppression living abroad can receive benefits in their countries of residence. In 2014, the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, in cooperation with the German Federal Ministry for Labor and Social Affairs, successfully managed to negotiate a bilateral agreement on the transfer of special benefits for Holocaust survivors who were employed for remunerations during their imprisonment in German Nazi ghettos. On the account of this uh, agreement from the 1st of June this year, Polish citizens will gain the right to be the benefits resulting from German pensions for work in ghettos law, known as CRBG. It wouldn't be possible without the negotiated agreement, as our citizens are already entitled to Polish pension for the same periods of incarceration in Nazi ghettos. And therefore, from the 1st of June, Polish citizens will be able to enjoy dual rights to both Polish and German benefits for the same ghetto work period. We, should, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that beneficiaries are today 80 or 90, and I hope that the introduced changes will secure them better lives. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Buccio. It's a special pleasure to invite Mr. Gary Koren, the ambassador of Israel to the Czech Republic, to the floor. The International Auschwitz Committee, which is now located in Berlin, was guided for many years by Noach Flug from Jerusalem, and um, he was very much obliged to all what we are talking about. So it's a special pleasure to give the floor to you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like, uh, first of all, to greet the Czech government and express gratitude to the auspices and hospitality given to this conference by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Labor 
and social affairs. Secondly, I would like to thank uh, Europe Shoah Legacy Institute Secretariat, headed by very capable director Halina Senik, and the Czech diplomats involved in a complicated, not always appreciated duty of the preparations for this event. No one doubts their commitment to the noble task. The Israeli delegation, which is here with us and have many officials from different government institutions, but also uh, representatives of uh, the survivors of uh, the Shoah uh, organizations and the survivors themselves who are here with us, is glad that uh, other countries uh, took active participation in the preparations of this conference and many more present here today to consider the topic of the welfare to the Holocaust survivors as a great importance. On behalf of my delegation, I would like to express the hope that the debates of the conference will be fruitful and helpful to those who on national or international level should get a clear picture as to the needs of the survivors and the effective ways of meeting these needs. Mr. Chair, on behalf of the new Minister of Senior Citizens of the State of Israel, I want to apologize for her absence due to the proceedings of formation of the new government in Israel and continuous parliamentary debates. The Director General of her office will join us tomorrow in the work of the conference and will present the measures taken by the Israeli government to provide welfare to the survivors, including a new program that was enacted in August 2014, in which for the first time offers compensation to all groups of Holocaust survivors in Israel. I would like to mention in this context that 50% of Holocaust survivors in the world live in my country. The average age is 83 and most likely that in five years majority of them will not be alive anymore. It is obvious that we have no more time to spare to guarantee their personal dignity and to deal with their social welfare needs. Ladies and gentlemen, during the conference we will undoubtedly be exposed to the complexity of the welfare issue, but one thing is quite obvious from our Israeli experience. Countries should establish or at least support establishment of specialized centers for survivors that will gather information, formulate best practices, and provide advice and solutions to all existing welfare-related problems survivors might encounter. Mr. Chair, after the Holocaust and the moral fracture that follow it, the leaders and the people of Europe called never again. Seventy years after the end of the World War II, it seems that the time is long overdue for the European Commission to lead an effort to establish permanent responsible authority, or at least an effective special envoy that will be able to integrate and to spearhead this complex matter in the European Union countries. A commitment to historical justice requires of Europe to complete this effort without any further delay. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the Israeli delegation, I'm glad that so many important participants are here with us today in order to have substantial debates that may help us to deal with the welfare of the survivors in a much better way and to make this conference a relevant scene for the accomplishment of this noble task. Prague Holocaust Assets Conference in 2009 and especially the Theresien Declaration seemingly created not only an important historical benchmark but also very much a guidance to us all. Six years passed. Some tangible achievements were made by some countries, but the moral gap and historical justice still, still require doing the last extra effort. Czech Republic not only served as one of the good examples to follow, but it played a key role in hosting and supporting ESLI. My country supports the work of ESLI very much, including in contribution to its budget. ESLI made its best and deserves to be praised and reinforced. But it is obvious that main effort lies with the state parties to the Theresien Declaration. So please use this event to synergize in order to improve lives of the survivors and their welfare as long as they are alive. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. You were mentioning the leaders of Europe. We have a fifth speaker now on this panel, and that's uh, a second try today. The video address from European Union Commissioner for Justice, Consumers and Gender Equality, Mrs. Vera Jourova. And that's why Martin Glasbergen from the Netherlands is here and trying to put it on now. Dámy a pánové, ladies and gentlemen, in January of this year, we commemorated the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz and the end of the Second World War. I had the honor to participate at the Holocaust Remembrance Ceremony that took place at the castle here in Prague in the presence of a number of survivors of the Shoah. The European Commission is very aware of the difficult situation in which Holocaust survivors in some countries find themselves. Often they live on a bare minimum, they are deprived of a decent pensions and social welfare and thus still suffer from the consequences of Shoah. To remit the situation is the primary aim of this conference. As was agreed in the Terezin Declaration of 2009, signed at the time by 46 countries. It is unacceptable that those who suffered so greatly during the earlier part of their lives should live under impoverished circumstances at the end. I could not agree more and I very much regret not being able to be with you today. The European Union has no competence or legal basis for action regarding social services and welfare support in general. Welfare systems fall 100% under the competence of the national governments. However, I very much welcome the initiative taken by the Czech government together with the Shoah Legacy Institute and others to give an important impetus to governments to ensure that survivors of the Holocaust and other victims at their advanced age finally receive the adequate social welfare support and necessary basic care. This is a question of respect, human dignity and moral responsibility. Why the EU's hands are tied regarding the welfare systems and direct payments. The European Commission has important instruments at hand to ensure that future generations will remember the legacy of the Shoah. In line with the Terezin Declaration, the Commission has developed a remembrance strand under the Europe for Citizens programme. Under this strand, the Commission finances projects on Europe as a peace project. We must keep the memories of the past alive while we build the future. The program supports initiatives which reflect on the causes of, among others, the Holocaust and the other Nazi crimes. Solid education about the past is a prerequisite for building on an inclusive and open-minded future. Also, the European Commission, like the European Parliament, have started holding Holocaust commemoration ceremonies on the 27th of January and has recently started holding internal seminars to ensure that Commission staff continues to be aware of the Shoah and its implications for Europe and the European Peace Project. Ladies and gentlemen, with great worry, we notice that anti-Semitism is on the rise in Europe once again. A Jewish school in Toulouse in 2013, the Brussels Jewish Museum in 2014, a kosher supermarket in Paris last January, a synagogue in Copenhagen in February. In some parts of Europe, Jews live in daily fear of their livelihood schools, synagogues and other Jewish buildings need to be protected by the police. 
It is appealing that 70 years after the end of the Shoah, the livelihood of Jews is once again endangered. This is not the Europe we want to build. Recently, the European Commission adopted the European Security Agenda. We agreed on strengthening security through disrupting international criminal networks, preventing terrorism and addressing radicalization and recruitment, raising levels of security for citizens and businesses in cyberspace, as well as strengthening security through border management. But security and protection, prevention, Education and remembrance cannot be the only answer. The attacks over the past months have challenged some of our deepest values. We must also ensure that those who deny the Holocaust, who incite to hatred, who engage in anti-Semitic and racist hate speech and crime, are brought to trial in line with European legislation. As European Commissioner for Justice and Consumers, you have my commitment that we will call on those EU member states that have not yet fully implemented this important European legislation. The European Union and I personally will do our utmost to guarantee a safe future for the Jewish people in Europe. Jewish people must not fear for their lives in Europe once again. It would be a clear failure for Europe if Jewish people and other communities did not regard Europe as a home anymore. We must fight this battle together. If Jews have no future in Europe, Europe has no future either. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you a fruitful conference with tangible outcomes for the survivors of the Shoah and other victims and improvements for their everyday lives. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks to Commissioner Jourova for underlining why we are all here. There's nothing to add.